Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for today. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that you'll prepare our hearts and our minds, Father, unto thee now. Sit us at the foot of the cross, so we're just looking unto thee and listening unto your words, Father. Lord, may we all get something out of today's message, apply it to our hearts, and Lord, make the changes necessary where we are living for you and are serving you without worrying about the world, without serving the world, but just serving you. Once again, Lord, we just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's just read these again, verses 12 to 18 of Psalm 69. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was a song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me. In the truth of thy salvation, deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up. And let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, and hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Now last week's sermon was on a false spirit. It was on a false spirit. If you missed it, it's on YouTube, so you can just quickly catch up with it if you missed it last week. There, was a, there is a false spirit, and it's a Jesus spirit, and it's not holy. It's a Jesus spirit, as we spoke on last week. And I'll just refresh your memories in 2 Corinthians 11. 4, it says, For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. Okay, so there is another Jesus. Whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit. Okay, from that we get, there is another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel, which we have not accepted. There's another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. And we see this as evidence today, out in Christendom. And we see this in the lost world as well, in the, in the heart and lives of the wicked, those who are unsaved. But this morning we're looking at signs of spiritual attack. Signs of spiritual attack. And look, last week we, we saw you now what the fruits of the Spirit are and what they are not. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. So you'll have love within your heart. You'll have joy within yourself. The world may be falling apart around your ears, but you'll still have joy within yourself. Now this is deep down joy. We're not talking about skipping down and, you know, tripping the light fantastic or whatever it is and pretending we're happy. No, this is deep down joy when things are going bad. You have joy in your life. You have Christ. And you have peace. You're not worried about anything. Now, we did our shopping last night, at, I think at Aldi for a bit, and I'm looking at the, at the shelves and I'm thinking, I wonder what happens if it ever goes empty one day. Panic. Will there still be joy in our hearts? Will we still have peace? Hopefully we're preparing for these sort of things. But will we have peace? And then where's, when it comes to others, are we long-suffering? Are we giving people plenty of time to turn from their sin? Yeah, we've got enough of our own. But are we giving people plenty of time to, to turn from their sin? Are we compassionate? Are we gentle with people? Or are we harsh? We, we're bitter. We like to argue. We just want to spit it out at them, but are we gentle and long-suffering with people? See it from the other person's point of view. See it from their eyes. You know, at times we can get like that, and I get it. We become frustrated. Things aren't going the way we planned. Uh, that's maybe the problem. Maybe it's the way we plan too much, and we can get angry at others. I've got to learn just to not get angry. The Lord's probably working through them like he's working through me and, and you're put in a position so he's teaching you something about patience, gentleness. And the last two, goodness and faith. You will have faith. 
you will not lose your faith. Yes, sometimes you may doubt it and you think, look at what's going on here. But after about 10 seconds of negative thought, you come back, no, God's in control. And if I keep my mind in the book, I will always be under his control, if I could say that. I will always be under it. He will be able to teach me things. And we also looked at what the opposites of the fruits were, and we saw this in 2 Corinthians 12, in the last half of this verse says, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. And this is in a church. This is in the church at Corinth. So how easy it is for us to go into that, into that being that in, in part of our life if we don't keep our minds focused on the Word of God. As I said earlier, the Bible is a self-canonizing book. It didn't take the, the King of England or the Queen of England or some scholar to say this, this, or this is, is right, but that, no, it's not. No, it's self-canonizing. We don't recognize that today. We need to. Ecclesiastes 7.9, let's just turn there quickly, please. Ecclesiastes 7.9. Just after Proverbs, <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 7, 9. It says here, be not, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. Woo! The spirit of anger. Be not be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. So this, since this is a self-canonizing book and a self-interpreting book now, we see that anger resteth in the bosom of a fool. So if you're going to flip your lid on someone, think of this verse. I'm just saying, been there, done that. Wow. The spirit of anger. Now, there are plenty of other evil spirits to help you along with the other anti-fruits of the spirit. King Solomon also said in just verse 7, back up a little bit, Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. You see, you can be made oppressed, and you might be a wise man, but it can send you mad. Sometimes today, we can be oppressed by these, what's going on in the world at the moment, with all these Different spirits around us, anger, wrath, malice, and we can, it can send us mad. But generally, we're wise. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad. And in verse 8, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So there's a patient spirit, and there is a proud spirit. You think you know everything. I don't, but the Bible does. <laughs> proud in spirit. What spirit do you have today? You can be oppressed by these spirits. See, to be in the spirit of the moment, what's your spirit in right now? Happy, glad, angry, bitter, oppressed, Maybe it's a coveting spirit, a worried about money spirit, heaping up wealth spirit. What sort of a spirit do you have? About wealth, Ezekiel 7.19 says, They shall cast their silver in the streets and their gold shall be removed. Their silver and their gold shall not be able to deliver them in the day of wrath. So we're talking about the day of the Lord here, the day of wrath of the Lord. So we're talking about in the tribulation. If you unfortunately miss out on the rapture and you make it through there, your gold and your silver is worth diddly squat. You've got digital money for that. That's where it's coming. That's where it's going. Your gold, your silver is worth nothing. They shall not satisfy their souls, neither fill their bowels. You're not going to get, you're not going to get fed because it is the stumbling block of their iniquity. It is the stumbling block of their iniquity. This is the spirit of of wanting to be wealthy. And we can all go down that road. It's amazing though. It's going to be worth nothing one day. Nothing. Your silver, your gold, your fiat money, 
like that. And we're waiting for that day. Waiting. It may be this year. We don't know. Prepare. So now to the sermon. Here are some signs of being under spiritual attack. There are more, but these are a good indication to start with. Number one, you have an adversary. Let's turn there now, please. So we're going to do a little bit of finger turning this morning. Let's keep our fingers warm. 1 Peter 5, 8. 1 Peter 5, 8. Turn with me if you could, please. 1 Peter 5, 8. It says here, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. You see, you have an adversary today, dear Christian. Even dear unsaved person, you have an adversary today who wants to keep you chained to hell. But here we see that Satan wants to devour you. So point one, you have an adversary. He, you exactly right, it is Satan himself. As a roaring lion, walking around, seeking whom he may devour. And he wants you. He wants to devour you. Point two, you are under spiritual attack for a purpose, a reason there may be why you are under attack. There may be a reason to it. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, 71. Psalm 119, 71. So last week we looked about the Jesus spirit and now we're looking at spiritual attack. How do you recognise spiritual attack? Psalm 119, 71, the word of God says, It is good for me that I've been afflicted. Wow. It is good for me that I've been afflicted. There's something I needed to learn. Something I really needed to learn about being afflicted. That I might learn what? Thy statutes, thy statutes. And a statute here I've written down, it's a a written law passed by a legislative body. We have the word of God. He's teaching us our statutes, his statutes, when we go through a spiritual attack. It can be for our own good. And generally it is for our own good. Because it pulls us in the line. You know, we can start drifting off back into, into worry and, and coveting and whatever else it may be. Fear is a big one at the moment. But yet his statutes, his word bring us back in the line. Your father in heaven may be trying to teach you something. He just may be. In verse 73 of the same chapter, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. You see, he's fashioning you. He's fashioning all of us into something usable. Point three, you are under spiritual attack when you have feelings of worthlessness. Do you go through that at times? Yes, we all do. I'll hold up two hands there on that one. Preacher. <laughs> but we do, we feel worthless. Well, guess what? It's a spiritual attack. Satan is trying to devour you. He's trying to take you down, render you useless. Basically, pulling the bolt back, taking the bullet out, throwing it away and recocking it so you've got nothing left in there to use. He's rendering you useless. But when the devil reminds you of your past, and I'm sure you've heard of this before, remind him of his future. And we see that in Revelation 20.10 where he's thrown in to the lake of fire. That's where he's headed. Remind him of that. But what does the Bible say about your past life? Let's just turn to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, chapter 43. I'll turn there with you to make sure I haven't made a mistake. Sometimes it happens. In verse 18 to 19, Isaiah 43, verses 18 to 19. This is about your past life, about your sin, okay, that you've been forgiven. 
It says here, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know? Know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You see, we've got to remember that if we're feeling worthless and unforgiven, that, hey, we've been forgiven. And he's making a new creature out of you. Don't forget this. Don't forget it. He is making something out of you. We had our devotion last night. I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, it was good. On that Dan Farrell gave a devotion on, the, on um, Zoom. And it was about her. It was Aaron and her were holding up the arms of Moses. Um, he did something special in, that, her, in her's life. Her, her wasn't a Joshua. He didn't go out and fight um, and got you know, a book written on Joshua. But her he's only mentioned a couple of times. So yeah, he seems insignificant, but yet he held up the arms of Moses so the battle wasn't lost. See, God works something in his life. And then he had a grandson who God called to be a, a um, artifice. I haven't got that right. An artificer, someone who makes things out of wood and brass and everything else, okay? Um, and he was cunning and clever with his hands and he did a lot of good for the temple and for God's people. And he was the grandson of her. The point is that God can make anything out of anyone if you'll just allow him. And it doesn't mean he's any less than Joshua or any of the other mighty men who fought the battles. He played an important part. He held up one of the arms of Moses. Moses was 83 years old and trying to hold it up for six to eight, ten hours wasn't looking real good. He started to drop and then uh, the Amalekites um, started to win. The Amalek started to win. So they had to hold his arm up. So they put a rock there for him to sit on and they held his arm up for him. You can do it. Don't think you're worthless. You are not. Psalm 71.20. Psalm 71.20. We'll just go there. Psalm 71.20. We were close to it before. Psalm 71. 20. Thou which has showed me great and sore troubles. And that's what, what happens to us at, at times. You know, we're feeling worthless. You know, Thou which has showed me great and sore troubles shalt quicken me again and shalt bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Because that's how you feel. You feel so low that you're in the depths of the earth, but yet you will be quickened, quickened with your great and sore troubles. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Don't feel worthless. When you're feeling worthless, you are under spiritual attack. Because God says here, you are a new creature. If you're feeling worthless, you are under spiritual attack. Please understand this. That's what it is. Because Satan is seeking to devour you. Devour you. And then Romans 8.1. It says, therefore, turn it up please. Romans 8.1. Romans 8.1. This is an important part of scripture that we need, we need to memorize so that we don't go feeling worthless and useless because we are not. It says here, Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, so not the world, but after the Spirit. No condemnation. You are a new creature. You are not worthless. If you're feeling worthless, and yes, we all go for those little pity parties, don't we? <laughs> yes, poor me. My wife's not doing this. My wife's not doing that. My husband's not doing this. He's not doing that. What are the kids doing? <laughs> and they'll say, well, what's mum and dad doing? Don't they know? <laughs> now we're growing up. We want this and that and everything else. Well, hey, come together. Come together. You're not enemies. 
If you're a family of Christians, you are all new creatures. All new creatures. And you are in the vine. So there's no condemnation for us. But things can weigh us down. Please, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. There's a little bit of turning this morning. Hebrews chapter 12. And this is why we do the sword search. So we can turn it up quick. Hebrews chapter 12. There are some words in here which we need to look at if we're feeling worthless. Things which might make us feel worthless. Wherefore, in verse 1, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, fellow Christians, etc., etc., let us lay aside every weight, what's weighing you down, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Are you weighed down today with something, and it's making you feel worthless? Don't you? You are a new creature. Things in our lives can weigh us down. Too many hobbies, too many things which money can buy. I know I like to get rid of some stuff. I really do. They they weigh us down and they take our time away from serving God. Things weigh us down. Maybe we're working too many jobs. I know to get my pilot's license, I worked three jobs, I think, (laughs) with a young family. And nearly ran off the road at one stage. <laughs> it's just not worth it. I've still got my pilot's license. But there's a price to pay. Things can weigh you down until you have a near-death experience. Things weigh us down and keep us out of the Word of God. Do we have dusty Bibles? Keep the dust off them. Read it. Because that's what's happening. If you're starting to feel worthless and things are weighing you down, you need to get into the Word. This is how we walk in the Spirit. It's how we walk in the Spirit. And the sin with doth so easily beset us. Isn't it so easy? When we have a little pity party, we're feeling worthless. It's so easy to jump into that. It really is. But you are not worthless. He's created you for a reason. And verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, So is the author, and then he finished it. Who, for the joy that was set before him, this I don't get, endured the cross. And he counted that as joy. And you tell me you're not worth it? He sees something in you. God knows he sees something in me, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, but he he must. Thankfully, it's Christ. All my works are as filthy rags, but he sees Christ in me. And he sees Christ in you if you belong to him. Endure the cross, despising the shame, as we saw in, in, um, in, in Psalm 69. And he's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's our future. We're not worthless. You're not worthless. You are under spiritual attack if you think you are. Satan is after your hide. Point four, you are under spiritual attack in times of prayerlessness. In times of prayerlessness, if you don't pray. When you or I feel overly guilty with sin, we must learn to confess it immediately. Immediately. And conviction's good. It means you're a child of God. That's good when you're convicted. Because you will sin. Don't let unconfessed sin linger because the longer you put off prayer, the harder it is to do. 1 John 1 9. We're in that neck of the woods. 1 John 1 9. And this is another one we should memorize. We should keep some core verses memorized in our hearts and minds so that when Satan seeks you, not if, when the doubts come, when the spiritual attacks come, you'll have something to rely on. It says here, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, hello, that's great news. That's great news, brethren. Great news. He is faithful and just when we confess our sins to forgive us and then he cleanses us from that sin. 
cleanses us. Faithful, just, forgive, cleanse, and all. Five words that stand out. All. Unrighteousness. Not just some, but all. Ezra 10.11. Ezra 10.11. Turn up to there. Ezra 10.11. And you're thinking, okay, where's that one? Yeah, I'm the same. No, it's <laughs> before Job. And if you sneak back a little bit from Job, once you get to Job, Ezra, Nehemiah. So it's Ezra. It's just before Nehemiah. Ezra 10, 11. Ezra 10, 11. Hmm. I've got this one highlighted a bit in my Bible. Now, therefore, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers. This is what Scripture is telling you to do. And do His pleasure, and look at this, and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. So we separate ourselves from sin. We separate ourselves from sin. But look at those words. Make confession unto the Lord God. We make confession unto Him. And Job 33, 27 to 28 has these words to say. He looketh upon men, and if any say, I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profited me not. See, there is no profit in sin. No profit in sin. None whatsoever. Verse 28 says in Job 33, He will deliver his soul from going into the pit, and his life shall see the light. If any say, I have sinned. We must confess. We must confess. Otherwise, it will be that spirit that attacks us. The spirit of prayerlessness. The spirit of prayerlessness. We need to see it for what it is. Sin, when we're not praying to our Heavenly Father. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Maybe turn that one up. Proverbs 28, 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. So you're not going to win if you're covering your sin. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You know, I've seen it's almost like a cult today. People say, just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yes, that is true. But you need to confess your sins. It's easy believism. Just believe in God and keep doing what you're doing. Don't forsake your sin. That's what they're saying today. The devils also believe and tremble because they know their end. See, that's another lie that we're hearing at the moment in Christendom. Just believe. Just live your gay lifestyle. Just live your adulterous lifestyle. Just live your covetous lifestyle from one hit to the next hit of whatever it is that keeps you alive and makes you happy at the moment. But oh no, don't trust in Christ. No, 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 you can't do that. No. We need to trust in Christ. Unless thou repent, thou shalt also likewise perish. Those words came from the sweet lips of Jesus. Unless you repent, you shall also likewise perish. Repentance comes from the heart, and it is a heart matter. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth, confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You know, sometimes we ask God to take away these desires of lust, covetousness, anger, greed, malice, backbiting, and I haven't written any more after that because there's a lot more. We pray that he just takes it away so that we're not encumbered or even tempted by it. But what does 2 Corinthians 12.9 say? 2 Corinthians 12.9. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I think we all should know this section of Scripture. You know, we want these things taken away so that we don't have to endure them anymore. But there's something that we need to learn about trusting 
in Christ and on Christ. And he said unto Paul, because Paul, he had this thorn in the flesh. And he asked God three times to take it away from whatever it was. Could have been physical, could have been emotional. And I think most people who comment on this in the commentaries would say it's this, that or the other based on their own experiences. You today can look at this and base it on your own experience. Whatever it is that you're having trouble with in your life, is it a sin? What is it? The Lord says unto him, my grace is sufficient for thee. In other words, I'm not taking it off you. Your propensity for sin, I'm not taking that off you. Because you've got to trust in me. You've got to trust in me. This is what Christ is saying to us. For my strength, this is Christ's, is made perfect in your weakness. You may struggle with a certain sin, but his strength, his strength is made perfect. Sorry, your strength is made perfect in weakness. For my strength, sorry, Christ's is made perfect in weakness. You see, when, when you're, you, a lot of people go for these self-help programs, and they can last for quite some time, but then people can go back into their old ways again. But if you're relying on Christ and you're keeping your eyes in the book, you won't go back to them. Because his strength has been made perfect in you. In you. He won't take away your propensity to sin. He wants you to trust him. Give it to him. Stop hogging it for yourself. Most gladly, therefore, says Paul, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Yeah, I've got a problem with that, but I'm going to rely on Christ not to do that anymore. The old sinful nature is still there, but I'm relying on Christ to keep me out of it. Not myself. You can't do it, neither can you. Christ can, and you'll see his power at work. You'll see his power at work. Point five, you are under spiritual attack when you have feelings of condemnation. Feelings of condemnation. Let's turn to Romans, please, chapter 8. Feelings of condemnation. Romans chapter 8. And we'll just read four verses. So you have feelings of condemnation. You're feeling condemned. You're condemning yourself or you're letting the world do the job for you. Romans 8, we'll read verses 1 and 2. There is therefore now, as we read before, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of the life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And then from 37 to 39. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Christ. Through him that loved us, Christ. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You are inseparable from him. And the sooner you and I start to realize we are inseparable from him, from him we may start to just rely upon him. And take him at his word. Read the scriptures. Get your head in the book. Because you're under spiritual attack when you don't. When you don't read your book, the Bible, you are under spiritual attack. And then Satan is trying to condemn you. He's seeking you. He wants to devour you. He wants to make your Christian life worthless doesn't care how much you know, he just doesn't want you to do anything for Christ. He doesn't want you speaking up for Christ. So this does not sound like a condemned man writing this book, does it? The apostle, he wasn't a condemned man. So don't believe your feelings, believing what God's words say. Believe what God's word says. 
Remember that verse, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So why are you feeling condemned? Totally no need. Point six, you are under spiritual attack because of the famine of the word. This might be the hardest thing to do when you are under spiritual attack, but it is the best possible thing you can do along with prayer because we know that there is real, living, active power in the word of God, so why not unleash it? As I said earlier on, it is self-canonizing, this Bible that we have in our hands. It says it wasn't written by man. It says that. Or what they thought. They were guided by the Holy Spirit and heard what they had to write down. And then it self-canonized itself by saying, read this in the other churches. This is to be read. This is God's word. It doesn't happen in man's books today. So we need to tap the power of God and stay in the Word. Psalm 119, please. Keep my eye on the time. Psalm 119. Please read the Psalms if you want wisdom and understanding in the Proverbs. Psalm 119, verses 9 to 11. Stay in the Word. Psalm 119, 19 to, uh, 9 to 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to what? Thy feelings, thy thoughts, thy word. Thy word. That's how you will cleanse your ways. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. We need to hold these words in our hearts. In our hearts. Then we won't be under spiritual attack. Under spiritual attack. Verses 15, it says here, to, um, 15 to 18, it says here, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. This is how we keep those spiritual attacks away. Stay in the word. Tap into this power. Remember, this book was written from outside of time. It's a supernatural book. We saw that just earlier on in Psalm 69. The messianic prophecies, and it all came to pass. The vinegar, the gall. He was hated, downtrodden, reproached. You are under spiritual attack in point seven through family conflict. It's not a guarantee, but if God says things will go better for you by honouring your parents, there's no doubt it will bring blessings. No doubt. No doubt. If there's family contact, excuse me, conflict, then the family is under spiritual attack. I've seen it. You've seen it. We've all seen it. Families that have been torn apart because of spiritual attack. You see, most, most, all of our problems are spiritual problems. All of our problems are spiritual problems. But yet the world applies pharmacia to it. What drugs can you get on to make you feel better? Are you really depressed or are you just overwhelmed with life? We'll touch on that shortly. We can become so overwhelmed that we'll quickly go in the opposite direction of Christ. I'm not saying not to go on certain medications, all right? Some people have to. But look at your situation. Do you really need to? Or are you under spiritual attack? And will a psychedelic drug really help? 
Sometimes, and I understand it, you've got to throw a bucket of water on the fire to put the fire out. But then you've got to look for the cause. What caused the fire in the first place? Prayerlessness? Not reading your Bible? Not following the precepts of God? Arguing with mum and dad or, or whatever the case may be. That's what I see families today heading towards this, this quick fix. When the fix is a spiritual problem. It's a spiritual problem. You know, when family conflicts come, and it's usually when, it's not if, pray and put on the whole armour of God. Ephesians 6, I think we don't have to go there. We understand what that is. Put on the whole armour of God. Read the Bible. It does it every time. Read God's word and he'll speak to you and he will help you. He will help you. 1 Peter chapter, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And this is basically, it's, it's aimed at women, but I think men can get something from it too. Children, we all get something from this. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 4 to 13. 1 Peter 3. Keeping my eye on the time. Better not go too much longer. I might just read a few. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Look at that. A meek and quiet spirit. Not an angry spirit. Which is in the sight of God of great price. In context, this is talking about women here, but I think we can all get something out of this. A meek and quiet spirit. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adored themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. So a meek and quiet spirit. Point eight. You are under spiritual attack when you are overwhelmed by life. And who doesn't feel overwhelmed at times? You got this come, this was coming on, and this something happened, something's happened to mum and dad, something happened to your kid. Um, the rent's due, the registration's just come in. You just get overwhelmed with it all. Batteries don't work. Oh, I forget to press a button. <laughs> Every, there's just so much going on, you become overwhelmed. And life does overwhelm us. Did being tired and hungry add to the situation? Yes, I get that too, thank you. Oh, it's normally about three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, I start to fade. I really do. Then I make mistakes. It's a good idea to turn the press off and go do something else before I waste more money. But being tired and hungry, sometimes, you know, that's when most people react in the worst way and probably give room for the devil. When you're tired and hungry. Good time not to front someone over something regarding whatever it is, if that's the way you're feeling. Go have something to eat, go have a little nap and see if things haven't changed in your mind, because they will. The Christian faith is not a one-horse race. We need Christ and his strength. Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. Philippians 4, 13. I don't want to go on too much longer. Philippians 4, 13. It says here, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now this is a very profound verse. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It only happens through Christ. Nobody else, no other way. Through Christ. You don't need drugs of any kind. You need to go through Christ. You don't need to go through pharmacia, the chemist or the doctor. I see no evidence for this in Scripture. The same. I'm not saying it's a totally wrong thing to do. I'm just saying, look at it in context. What's happening in your life? Do you really need a psychedelic drug? Or are you just overwhelmed? There's usually one day in the week that I get overwhelmed with everything and then I've got to sit down, have a cup of coffee, think things through, and then move on. Start quoting scripture. You see, it's something about the heart. Psalm 61, 1 to 3. Or shall I just read it from here? 
from the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, this is what the psalmist is saying, when my heart is overwhelmed, tur- turn there if you please, Psalm 61, 1 to 3. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. See, your heart is overwhelmed. Heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Remember the enemy? It's Satan and he wants you. And he'll put you under spiritual attack each and every time. Count on it. I can guarantee that one. But when my heart is overwhelmed, the heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. And it gets overwhelmed. Just underwhelm it. Cut things back maybe. Underwhelm it. Change things in your life. Don't go to drugs. We all know what they can do. You become addicted. Mm. Matthew 19, 26, But when Jesus beheld them, he said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. When will we get it through our thick heads, me, that everything is possible through God? We don't have to rely on man. We don't have to rely on pharmakia. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God hath not given, us, not given us the spirit of fear. Oh, look at that. There's another spirit. A spirit of fear. But what? But of power and of love and of a what? A sound mind. You won't be in Nana land. You will have a sound mind. You won't be freaking out with everything that's going on about the world around you. You will be steadfast in Christ. You will have a sound mind. But if you're living in the spirit of fear, then you have succumbed to that spirit. Succumbed to it. And you won't have a sound mind. 2 Corinthians, I better roll right along. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to 9 says this. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we desired, excuse me, despaired even of life. They wanted to die. This is the Apostle Paul. Wow. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. Hello. But in God which raises the dead. How much more scripture verses do we need? Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver right now in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Deliver us. This is Paul. He despaired even of life. Are you so overwhelmed that you despair of life? Go to God. Don't go to drugs. Go to God. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. You see, this is where we go wrong when we're under spiritual attack. We kick God out and we put our own understanding in. We do it. We do it. But he says, don't do it. (laughs) Come to me and I will give you that strength because my power and glory will show through you when you change and rely on me. This book is an extremely powerful book. We need to read it and physically, spiritually, emotionally, apply it to our lives today. So in conclusion, don't let Satan, the liar, trick you and tell you that you are worthless or condemned. You're not. You're a new creature. Don't let life lead you to despair and come to the point of giving up. Don't. Don't stop praying. Keep your prayer life going. Don't fall back into the life you came out of. Don't fall back into it. God will discipline every child he loves. God is for you and not against you and won't forsake you. 
even if you do forsake him for a time. The battle is real, the enemy's invisible, because Ephesians 6.12 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. So let's put on Ephesians 6. Let's put on the whole armour of God. So today, do you need to repent and recommit? I suggest you do it. Repent of trusting in self. Recommit yourself to Christ and his ways. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Never leave you nor forsake you. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lead not unto your own understanding. And this, brethren, is something that we can do. We can lean unto our own understanding. And we really need to understand that it's Christ that we need to go through. Not this world, not the drugs, not anything else. It is all about Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for your words. And Lord, when we are under spiritual attack, we just pray, Lord, that we will just turn to you and turn to your word. For in your word, Father, is power and strength and a winning life. Father, we just pray that this week, when we see, when we see and when we understand and, and even feel the spiritual attacks that come upon us, that you would help us, Lord, to be bold, to pray and to trust and to seek your face. Once again, Lord, we just thank you for your words today and may we all take heed. In Jesus' name we pray.